Today we're going to talk about Omid Scobie. He's an author and he's written a book that's uh, apparently caused a little bit of a stink. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Well, yeah, he was a person covering the royal family during the Meghan era when she was actually in London. And then he's written, I think this is his second book, I think he wrote another, but this one's called The End Game. And apparently he published the names of two people who are considered racist, and that created quite a stir. And he's being put on the, called on the carpet here by this interviewer very effectively. I think you'll find this very short video interesting. Well, Harry and Meghan... They kind of are largely untouched from negativity from your pen in this. So, you know, a lot of the speculation is that you are a mouthpiece for Harry and yeah. Meghan. So what is your relationship with Harry and Meghan at the moment? I'm not their friend. I've never sat down with Meghan privately for interviews. I've never uh, exchanged information with Meghan. I'm not in their private world in any way whatsoever. Are you fighting their corner? No. It feels like I have been, are. during Meghan's time as a working member of the royal family, I was extremely sympathetic for the mm -hmm. position she was in. I was one of a number of journalists that are part of that small pack that covered the story for, as a full-time job. For me, there were things that I saw being written about in the press, that comments that were being made about her, unfair treatment when it came to how she was being written about compared to say how we've written about others in the past. And so I called it out. You know, I work in the American press. I'm not restricted by some of the limitations of being a member of the British press and that relationship with the royal family. So I did go on television and talk about the racism that she faced. And rather than anyone wanting to talk about it or listen about it, I was called her fan, mouthpiece, cheerleader, etc. So I can't run away from that narrative. It's stuck. You know as well as I do that tabloid nicknames stick forever. But Harry well, and Meghan... See, this is where I have a bit of a... I don't mean to cut across Yeah, you. go for it. I find a lot of this content quite tabloidy too. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, you got to bear it, the brunt it, of that as it well. It delves into... As part of the American press crew, you don't have a, a role within the, the reporting pack over here with the royal family. We know Meghan was in touch with the first book and, and, and sent some advice your Well, way. she wasn't in touch with the first book. Via an aide. She spoke to her communications officer, and I discovered that okay. at the same time as the rest of the world so it did. Happened. But it's, um, so it happened. It's so, the job of a communications officer at the palace to deal with the press. All right, Greg, what do you got? So let me first start off by saying Mark and I have been discussing something for weeks, weeks in front of you right here. We're trying to come up with a name for this glass painting. We had different names. And I call Mark and I think we have a good one. I, I was sitting doing something else and thought of fourth walling. Fourth walling in theater is where you don't break that plane. You assume nobody's there. What we see in a lot of these guys when they come in doing what I'd call glass planing before is they come in with a story that they're going to tell you. They're going to respond to the questions they've prepared to respond to and not to others. And that's fourth walling. They're not interacting. They're not improv They're acting. They come with their own solution. We're going to see him do that a lot as he goes into this. But we see increased blink rate going into this whole thing. And then the minute the question comes out, he does an eye lock, immediate eye lock. And we say that eye lock is about seeing threat and recognizing threat. What's fun to watch for me is this lady interviewer is down to the right and shows slight disgust when that hatchet job question is asked. The male interviewer is doing something I, I beautifully love to see. I call brow beating, and that's looking under your brow as he looks at him and he's batoning with his head. This is brow beating on a global scale. I mean, one of the best I've seen. Then you see Scobie tilt his head in data intake, and that's just organism doing what the organism's done. He's waiting, and he can barely wait until the question's asked, boom, right out of the gate, no. And then you pay attention, though, as he starts to condition what he's saying, he backs away in the chair, and he has a slight smile as he does that not their friend. And you guys know how much I love an elongated vowel. An elongated vowel says, hold on, why, why'd you say that? Then he goes on to qualify, never met. We never sat down for interviews. The next question should be, what does that mean? But the guy does a similar question, the interviewer, and he, he should have just hammered him a little bit harder because then Scobie goes into this chaff and redirect. And, you know, I, I, my notes say I'm a Scorpio and I like woodworking. That's about as pertinent as what he's saying here. It doesn't really matter. Then when he, when he starts to say Harry and Meghan, the, the one thing that happens wrong in this is the interviewer interrupts that and should have let him talk. His feet draw back under when he says it's tabloidy. Look, I, I'm just going to say this is going to be one of the best examples of this thing Mark and I have been talking about for weeks right here in front of you. Mark, what do you got? 
Yeah, so this is interesting because there's a, there's some interesting relationships going on here. We've got the the female uh, interviewer. I think it's Alison Hammond, who kind of looks she's a, looks like she's lost a relative. <laughs> so it seems like she's at some kind of funeral. I mean, so it's interesting. No, like what's going on there? Why is she so down about this whole thing? Why is she so upset? We're not mind readers. We don't know. But I'm very interested in what's going on here. Uh, the male interviewer here, I think it's Craig Doyle. This is going to be quite an aggressive interview and quite aggressive for this particular show. This is, uh, as I understand it, this is this morning. Um, in, 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 in my experience, it's a, it's a lighter show. So they're coming in, or certainly he's coming in quite hard. I think he actually took a little bit of criticism from the public in general after this, that maybe he was too hard in this. I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure about, about that. But what do we actually get here? Uh, what is your relationship, is, is the question asked. Well, he answers with everything that it's not not what it is. He says, I'm not their friend. I've never sat down, never exchanged information, not in their private world. But the question wasn't, what's it not? The question is, what is it? So he's answering in the negative. That's already steering past, you know, the hot, the hot topic of this. And his head goes back at the same time. Something's going on here. He kind of suggests he's not restricted by the limitations. He sees he sees himself outside the press royal relationship. That kind of suggests he's a little bit anti-establishment. Um, and the interviewer uncovers, I would suggest, that he that this might be just a one-way channel from Markle to him. If he's not a friend, if he's never sat down, if he's then really it's just information coming from Markle through the press office direct to him and no chance for him to talk back and go, well, what do you mean by that? Who what, you know, are you sure about those names? So it's a one-way channel. And the interviewer, Craig Doyle, narrows his eyes and says it's quite tabloidy. And so clearly aggressive at that point. Interesting start, but I think Scobie looks quite well prepared on this. Lots of gestures there in the truth plane, lots of symmetry going on here. That will change as, as we move along. Chase, what do you got on this one? Today's video is sponsored by Aura. I'm excited for this because I've been using this app for over two years. If you didn't know how much private information is out there on the internet about you, when you first see it, it's pretty shocking and maybe a little disturbing. These people that collect all these private things about you are called data brokers, but there's a secret here. They have to take down your information if you ask them to, so they make it incredibly hard to do. So what we do is let Aura handle that for us. And you can do the same. You can let Aura do all the work tracking down and removing all the stuff that you don't want online. And you can try Aura for two weeks for free using the link uh, right at the top of the description down there. And Aura does a ton more than just getting your information off the internet. They protect you from threats that you and even your kids can't see coming. And it's super easy to set up. You don't have to go download a million different apps to get all the benefits that Aura has, like parental controls, antivirus, VPN software, password management. They even have identity theft insurance, everything. One of my friends was over here sitting in this office just a week ago, and I typed his name in. And within just a few minutes, we found everything. Even his anonymous accounts were on the dark web and the passwords associated with those. He downloaded Aura that night. So you should look into this. Your private information should be private. You can go to Aura.com slash TBP, just like the behavior panel, TBP, right now to start a free two-week trial that I've also linked down in the description. Yeah, I agree. And to your point, Greg, when it, there's the phrase, I'm not their friend, there's a definite postural retreat. And this is when we lean back away from something. And this is kind of a way of distancing ourselves from a topic and also setting a little boundary or that space becomes a boundary. And I think he means this. And I think he's being honest here about this statement, which is, you know, this can maybe why you clicked on this video to see, is he full of crap? Or is he telling the truth? We're going to dig into that too, uh, which is one of the most important things to know that 
the, probably people are looking for when it comes to this guy, as I understand it, there's a lot of internal dialogue, eye movement, which is when we're kind of talking to ourselves, rehearsing something, our eyes move down and left. And this is just the home base for some people. So this is where the eyes normally go. So it's important to casually pay attention to this while you're speaking to people. So getting good at eye movement isn't about the crap you hear on TV when somebody's looking one way, they're accessing the creative part of their brain, which means they're lying. That is horribly unreliable. So get some good training and you'll start seeing how powerful some of this stuff really is. But as a behavior profiler, when I see somebody who is head to toe covered in fads and the latest styles, there's something I've never seen an exception to, to this day. When somebody lives like this, they are highly suggestible. They tend to lack stability in their life, and they tend to feel a deep lack of identity, actual identity. So these people are typically on a quest for some kind of self-discovery, but they kind of remain strangers to themselves. And I think this is amplified by the fact that he's muting all of his emotions. There's nothing whatsoever genuine in this video clip that's different than dishonesty, though. So him being not genuine does not mean he's dishonest. So I think he's telling the truth from behind the costume that he's wearing here. Scott? All right. First, I want to talk about the interviewers. The, the, like Mark was saying earlier, the the man, I can't, what's his, anybody know his name? Uh, yeah, it was, um, it's Craig Doyle. Craig. Okay. Well, yeah. when Craig comes right. in, he's, he's loaded for bear. He comes in hot and he's, he's doing what the a normal guy would do. And you come in and you, and you've decided this person is being deceptive. That's what he's, uh, I'll be under the impression he's already decided this guy's full of it and he's going in for him. So, and that's the typical protocol you see when a guy goes in, they, they're being all aggressive, aggressive. He's doing that. So, which is, which is fine. That's normal. But now let's talk about, and what's the woman's name? Does anybody know? Yeah, that's Alison Hammond. Alison. Now, I love her because she, when I, when I first watched this, this video, four seconds in, I, I was under the impression this guy, no matter what he's doing or talking about, he's guilty of it or he's being deceptive or something because you can see it all over her. She's having none of it. She doesn't look at him for mo most of the interview. And when she does ask questions, or so watch when this comes up, as she speaks, as he talks to him, then she looks down and away from him. Doesn't even look at him when she's talking to him most of the time. So she, she she's had it. And we also see where she crosses her her uh, her torso and has her right hand gripping her left hand, and she's squeezing a little bit. I think she's uncomfortable because she's not saying what she wants to say in the fashion she wants to say it. She's not delivering her message the way she really wants to. So I so I think that's what she's she's sort of holding herself back a little bit from from an emotional standpoint, because I think she sees it already. So we know she's uncomfortable there. And the reason she feels uncomfortable, and I talk about it all the time on here, but I'm going to go over it one more time because we get a lot of uh, uh, people who haven't seen our show before. They'll come in and go, what are they talking about? The male brain and the female brain are different. Now, I'm not just saying that because that's something I think. It's a fact. It's science. You can look it up. There's no question about it whatsoever. They are different. And their intake of information is a little bit different. And the way that they decipher information is a little bit different from each other as well. So the, a woman's brain, a female brain, takes in information in, in a fashion that lets it uh, take in larger chunks. And it gets a lot more information than the male brain gets. And when she gets all this information, it starts, it goes back to the locus ceruleus to make a long story short and starts sifting through these things and say, where have I seen this before? Is this familiar to me? Is this good or is this bad compared to what I've seen before? Excuse me. And that's what's happened because men get what what's called the gut feeling. We had all those guys, we go, yeah, we got a gut feeling. I think this women don't do that. They have the most powerful uh, power of all. And that's women's um, intuition. So when they get that and they decide that something is a specific way or someone's not being honest or someone's being deceptive, you can almost count on it. 95% of the time, in my experience anyway, seeing that, they can call it quick. That's what's happening. He's going in. He's already decided he is, but he doesn't know for a fact from the, the things his brain's gathered that the guy is, is, is guilty or being deceptive. But I think 
looking at it from that perspective, she sees it that way. She sees that she doesn't believe him. She's not buying it. So the female brain and the male brain, this is a great example of seeing those two things side by side, treating the, I'm not going to call him a suspect, the, the person in questions answers and the way a male sees them and the way a female sees them when they're both their brains have engaged and gathered up this information. Now, let's talk about the body language, language of SCOBY. When he starts talking about not knowing Megan or Harry, he, he straightens up and he smiles real big. And he, but, but at the same time, he backs up a little bit. He goes up, starts backing up a little bit. Now, that can mean one of two things. It can mean one of a thousand things. But usually we see that and say, oh, that person may be being deceptive because they're, they're, they're backing up. They're separating themselves from that situation going on because they feel uncomfortable. I think he feels uncomfortable saying he doesn't know her because I think he's under the impression that some people already assume that he's friends with him. That's how he got the information that he got. So when uh, when we see that, that, that right there made me say something's up here. And I can't tell if that smile is a full-blown, from his uh, standpoint, an emotional, real smile because he's Botox. He's just jacked with Botox. And I can't tell what's going on. Usually in a Duchenne smile, we or Duchenne, we see the, a little squinting here. It's different than normal squints. We've talked about that before. But that lets you know when a, a, a smile is real or not. We see virtually nothing from the, the mid part here on up. There's nothing moving around. Even the obicularis oculi, these little muscles down here, they don't move much at all either. When I first saw this guy, I called Greg and I said, hey, man, is this guy 23 or 58? I can't tell. He's, he's just an odd looking guy with all the work he's had done. He's had mouth stuff done, I believe, from looking at him. I don't know what all he's had done, but he, he, he's he's an odd looking character with all the stuff he's had done. So I agree with you, Chase. I don't think he has settled on his I identity of, of who he is yet. But I can't, I, I still, and what'd you tell me, Greg? He was 41 or something? 41 or 42. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah. So right there in the middle of what I thought, I, I just couldn't tell. But, uh, as he illustrates, let's pay attention to that because he's you can see his arms moving around, stuff like this. But then we see it very clearly that he starts illustrating with this little fish thing he's doing with his hand into his hand like this with his fingers closed. We're seeing no space between those fingers, which lets us know we usually um, put that in the, in, in the little box of there's no not much confidence there. The more space between your fingers, the more confidence you have or the person has. They could be on the table. They could be talking to you like this. Whatever it is, or they're they're gesturing like this, the more space they have to, between their fingers, the more confidence they have as they're moving along. There is no space between his fingers. They're just sitting here like this, and he's pumping into his hand like that. It's just really weird looking. So he's he's trying to to come on like he's confident, and I believe that's the reason for those elongated words at the end of the sentences, like Greg was talking about. That that is, irks me to to the end because he just keeps talking and everything he's saying at the end. So I believe sometimes when he is confident, he does that. But when he's not confident, but he's trying to act like he's confident about it or give you an answer that he's sure of or feels like he's sure of, he wants you to believe, that's when we hear those things get really long at the end. Those words being long, elongated m much uh, I was going to try to time it, but the times are are, are various. Are, they vary on there compared to what his usual uh, speed is for words at the end of the senses. But still, then we see those those uh, tongue juts. They're not really tongue juts. I think it's just a little tick he's got from from the lip work. You know, we've seen it several times on here when someone has had their mouth done. They'll do that little thing like that where they look like a cross between a bird, a turtle, and a you know um, a fish or something. You know, this, this weird tongue thing they're doing. And then when the interviewer says, we know Megan was in touch for the first book, then watch his left foot, Ahmed's left foot. The thing raises up and it stays there for a second. And it's almost like it's akin to or similar to when, when, when you ask someone something, or you're saying something, the person's wanting to say, hang on a second. I know I, I've got an answer for that. I think that's what's happening there because that foot goes up. It's almost like saying, hang on a second while that person is talking, which gives puts me... Uh, in the mindset that he's got an answer loaded and ready for that. He was already ready for that question. So he's got one that he's rehearsed and is, he may not have rehearsed it out loud. It sounds like he did, but he's a writer. So his vernacular is really good. It's, it's, it's really clean. Everything that he talks about makes a little picture for you. It's great when he's, when he's explaining things, 
but I believe this one has a little bit uh, extra pop to it because he's thought about that for a while, how he's, he's going to reply to that. So when we see that foot goes up, that means we're seeing something that's psychologically um, uncomfortable for him. And that little cue right there, that, that, that really got my attention. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's important. And his voice speeds up a little bit. He starts talking about that as well, especially when he's talking about not knowing uh, Megan and not being friends with her. Listen to how his, his throat sort of tightens up a little bit, which makes his vo voice tones, vocal tone go up some, and it gets louder as he's talking. Then when he's explaining why he did this or why he wrote this book, he starts, he places himself in this ethical spot of, of what a great guy he is. Like he's a hero for talking about this stuff that, that nobody's talking about. Well, nobody's talking about it because nobody really cares because nobody really believes it. That's my impression. They can, there could be a lot of people that believe that and it could be true. I don't know, but that's the feeling I get. And we talk about, I talk about it sometimes uh, where Kafka says, uh, everyone is necessarily the hero of their own story. I say it's it's a that Kafka says that he only he doesn't say that he didn't say that sentence himself. But in his writings, you look at things like the Metamorphosis, the Trial, and the Castle. That's what his books are based on. There's a guy named John Barth that actually said that he was a another he was an American writer, more of a modernistic uh, literature uh, guy, and he's the one that actually said that. But when you look at Kafka's writings and his work, he does that most every time in his books. He, he makes whoever is in the spot the hero of the story, which is common. That's a, a common theme throughout literature and psychology. But so I'm going to call that the Kafka maxim every time I bring that up. So I'm going to sort of coin that now. So when somebody starts talking about whatever the, the problem is and they put themselves, I did it because I'm the hero and it was best for everyone if I did this, I'm going to call that the Kafka maxim. So, all right. Uh, I'm going on too long. Hey, one, one, so, quick, one quick question, guys. Anybody else think that statement about not being bound by the same rules as the UK was out of place for what he was talking about? It felt awfully awkward to me. Uh, it was, a lot of that in there. He, what, he, what he's saying by that is that he was a, um, he was, uh, a reporter in the US. Right. And yeah, so, yeah, I get and it, so but it just not, felt out of the way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think he's trying to maneuver his way out of, even if he did put these names forward, yeah, which yeah, would yeah. not be in the I do rules too. Of, of the I UK. Do too. I um, do too, yeah. Yeah, so there's a re I think there's a reason for it. It's probably oddly placed in, in this, because that wasn't asked yeah. at this point. That's right. That's what I was saying. It's out, of, out, of, out, of, out of the way. Yeah. 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 Cool. Dang, Greg. Get up in there, man. Get you some of that. Wow. My, my camera's too, my camera's closed. One of those tape replays. Harry and Meghan, they kind of are largely untouched from negativity from your pen in this. So, you know, a lot of the speculation is that you are a mouthpiece for Harry and yeah. Meghan. So what is your relationship with Harry and Meghan at the moment? I'm not their friend. I've never sat down with Meghan privately for interviews. I've never uh, exchanged information with Meghan. I'm not in their private world in any way whatsoever. Are you fighting their corner? No. It feels like I have you been, are. during Meghan's time as a working member of the royal family, I was extremely sympathetic for the mm -hmm. position she was in. I was one of a number of journalists that are part of that small pack that covered the story for, as a full-time job. For me, there were things that I saw being written about in the press, that comments were being made about her, unfair treatment when it came to how she was being written about compared to say how we've written about others in the past. And so I called it out. You know, I work in the American press. I'm not restricted by some of the limitations of being a member of the British press and that relationship with the royal family. So I did go on television and talk about the racism that she faced. And rather than anyone wanting to talk about it or listen about it, I was called her fan, mouthpiece, cheerleader, etc. So I can't run away from that narrative. It's stuck. You know as well as I do that tabloid nicknames stick forever. But Harry well, and Meghan... See, this is where I have a bit of a... I don't mean to cut across Yeah, here. go for it. I find a lot of this content quite tabloidy too. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, you got to bear it, the brunt it, of that as it well. It delves into... As part of the American press crew, you don't have a, a role within the, the reporting pack over here with the royal family. We know Meghan was in touch with the first book and, and, and sent some advice your well, way. Well, she wasn't in touch with the first book. Via an aide. She spoke to her communications officer, and I discovered that okay. at the same time as the rest of the world so it happened. But it's, um, so it happened. It's so, the job of a communications officer at the palace to deal with the press. 
It's a conversation that we should be having at. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it really is. I guess it's the matter of the way things have played out since the book has come out. Um, primarily a name being named in the Dutch version of your book. Well, two um, names, two, two names. names. Um, that just seems bizarre to everybody out there because you don't accidentally put in a name and you can't put it down to mistranslation, can you? It does feel like a stunt to sell books, which I understand. I wish it was you the know, case. But, okay, how did it happen? Um, you know, it, it's still being investigated right now. What do you think happened? I wrote and edited the English version of the book with one publisher. That, co that then gets man uh, licensed to other publishers. I obviously can't speak Italian, German, yeah. French, Dutch, or any of the other languages that come out. So the only time you hear about the book is once it's come out in the public domain. I'm as frustrated as everyone else. I make it very clear in this book that I, in every way possible, want to adhere to the laws surrounding this subject. Mm. It's why I've been very careful in how it's described in the book. And it's why I've never spoken about it beyond what I've said in the public domain before. The reality is, though, is that this is information that is not privy just to me. Journalists across Fleet Street know, have known those names for a long time. We've all followed a certain code of conduct when it comes to talking about it. It's frustrating that now what's going on in the Netherlands with the book that was obviously immediately rescinded and is now being reprinted has happened, and I'm glad to hear so. But for me, I can only talk about the English version of the book that I wrote and produced. But are you and upset have never by been, it, though? Are you have upset never by been, it that, that those names came out when it had not, you didn't want that to happen? I had never submitted a book that had their names in it. So I can only talk about my version. Yeah. I'm obviously frustrated. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm upset about yeah. it because, to be honest, I've been operating in a bubble of no emotion for the last 10 days. But I am frustrated about it, just like I am many of the other things that I've seen. All right, Chase, what do you got? Can we go back and do that again? Yeah. Yep. All right. Chase, what do you got? So they ask, uh, what do you think happened? And uh, this guy says, it's still being investigated. Scoby, whatever his name is. And when somebody asks this question, and you don't know, what you would expect to hear is, I don't know why this happened, or I'm not sure. When somebody says it's still being investigated, this is probably an attempt to hold back. Essentially just saying, I need to find out how much information is going to come out of that investigation so I don't say too much. That's what I heard there. That's pretty suspicious. And he's also performing a lean with a head tilt there, with no facial expression whatsoever. And this neck exposure is something people do to convey innocence. And we tend to expose vulnerable parts of our body, bodies, like arteries, when we're feeling safe or when uh, we issue a challenge to somebody. You see people getting ready to fight and their neck goes up and their arms go out. Uh, this display, though, is not genuine. So we tend to either conceal arteries when we're feeling scared and we expose arteries when we're feeling a little more comfortable or when we're trying to pretend to feel comfortable when challenging another primate. So I think it's unusual here that he specifically mentions never having submitted a book with their names in it. That word submitted was weird to me and I don't, I don't know anything about this case. So I may be way off if I am. Uh, I'm sure you'll just Call me an idiot in the comments. So I'm willing to bet there's something going on here where he's maybe shared an informal draft or something he's handwritten before that had these names in it. And he's using the word submitted as a safeguard against the accusations. So this is where it's really important to be able to see this kind of new word come out, which he hasn't used before, being able to hear between the lines not just see between them, but hearing between these lines is such an important skill. And even, even if I'm wrong about this guy, that's it's an incredible skill to be able to pick up on these new words that start showing up that you haven't seen before. We always talk about behavioral changes, but we're, we're also looking for syntax changes, like how is somebody's word choice changed throughout a conversation? Scott, what do you got? All right, let's take a look at this woman again. We actually see an expression of disgust on her face. We saw one earlier. It wasn't as big. It this is, is 
Yeah, yeah. This is uh, like a almost full blown disgust expression on her face. Again, she's not she's not even looking at him. Not very much. Not very often. She cuts her gaze away from him every time he looks up. Uh, her torso again isn't pointed toward him. Isn't aimed at him. So she's not engaging. She doesn't want to engage with this guy. I I, I understand why. But here's something really interesting. When he's trying to give the impression of sincerity, well, like we talked about earlier. The end of those words got of his senses, the words got longer. Here they get even longer at the end of those things. So I think now they're going longer because they give him, and it doesn't, it may seem out of uh, off kilter to you a little bit because it's not that much time at all, but it gives you time to think. When you know what you're going to say and you're going to elongate a word like that, it gives you that time to sit there and think about what you're going to say. Your brain doesn't need much time to start arranging things and and putting things in order of, of how to explain something or to give your answer. So I think that's what's going on there. Another odd thing we see in this, that there are almost zero uh, blink rate spikes. When we see a, a normal blink rate, which is 15 to 20 times a, sec, a minute when someone is blinking, that's normal. We don't see any, we, we don't see that and go, ah, oh, that's nothing wrong with that. But in here, sometimes they'll, they'll, burst up to you know 60 90 times and at the you know or at the high end of it and that lets us know there's psychological discomfort there and we're not seeing any of that here where in my opinion we should be so this is kind of odd for me is not seeing that there may there are a couple of places where we see them go up just a little bit but not even really much to to talk about but there's there are no uh no flutters no anything like that so i thought that was a little bit odd and he should be stressed during all that Another thing that we're not seeing is him go, hang on a minute. No, I didn't do that. That's not what happened. You've got this wrong. He's not buttoned up against the guys. He's not, he's not coming back at him. He's just accepting it all and giving these prepared answers. That, that puts me in a position to say, and personally, I would go in deeper there. I'd let him say all he's going to say. Then I would just jump down his throat with all that because he should be saying, no, that's not what happened. He's it, coming out of that identity he's created or whatever whoever he is and said no that's not right man let me tell you how it is you know and if the guy kept talking you shut them down he would have sh tried at least tried to shut him down he does sort of butt up against them when he starts talking there at, at the first time in this but it's not worth anything it, it, he's not he's not angry he's he should be mad and stay mad uh, that this is happening uh, when he says he's frustrated, like everyone else, that's his way of, of sort of hiding in a crowd. I, I'm frustrated, just like everyone is. No, everyone's not frustrated. They, I think they understand what's happened here. And you're right, Chase. What he did was, um, for, and I would think, I have no earthly idea, but I would put money on it, that he wrote He wrote the original thing. I think he wrote the book originally and put the names in it. And we sent these things out to these other publishers. He either accidentally or on purpose I think it was, uh, were they Dutch? Was that the, the publisher, a Dutch publisher? Dutch publishers. Okay, well, he sent it to them, and he messed up. He didn't. He put in, he left the one with the words in there. Or what he could do is, if they put it in there without his, without outside of the edit he was supposedly, they supposedly got, then he could, he would own that publishing company. He, this is, he's doing a book on scandal. You got to be real careful in there. There's, there's legalities you got to watch out for. And if they did that to him, he should, he should have, we shouldn't even have seen this guy again. We usually said, yeah, I'm suing them for this. And he's not, he's not doing that at all. He's not, it didn't even come up. So I, I, I think he did that too. I, I think he sent him something either by accident or on purpose. Like it's, it's either a draft or just a full on edit, but it sent the edit by accident to them. And I think that's where they got that information. Scott, you know. you've talked to a lot of people in a lot of interrogation rooms and like not even interrogation rooms, like hotel conference rooms and stuff and like unusual oh, yeah. places and unusual people. The one thing I'm no doctor, but I studied neuropharmacology for three entire years. The one thing that came into my mind when I was watching this video, and maybe it'll resonate because you've talked to some interesting people. I had one word pop into my head in video one this morning uh, it was Vicodin. Ah, uh, okay. That's what I was thinking because okay. we're going to see some some stuff go on with some veins here in uh, in an upcoming video that may 
yeah. go because I would have thought beta blockers, but with the Venus interaction that we're going to see in an upcoming video, that rules out the beta blocker hypothesis. Yeah. Okay, and and that would that would give us that slow movement, those really slow, smooth movements he's got as well. I would agree, I would I would tend to agree with that. So, uh, Mark, as an opinion. Got, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. With, I agree with your opinion, which is yeah. Okay, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So the question here is something along the lines of what do you think happened? It's a question in the positive. We're asking for a series of events or situations in the positive. Well, he comes back with, I never submitted a book that had their names in. He's coming back with what didn't happen, not with what. And we can easily come up with our ideas of what we think happened. And those ideas might be accurate or inaccurate. Something in between may have hit on it or not. Don't really know. But ultimately, we could come up with positives. If somebody was able to come up with a positive, especially an investigative journalist, which is what he is, if somebody says, look, well, what do you think happened? And they say, well, it's being investigated. And it's like, well, why not by you? Because that's, you know, that's your job. I mean, the, what an interesting thing to investigate is what actually happened. And what are your theories so far for the positive? What he has is a certainty around the negative there. Well, I mean, maybe maybe it's true. Maybe he did never submit a book that had their names in it. But what's interesting is there is quite a bit of vocal cry across what he says generally, especially at the end of sentences. But this particular sentence has vocal fry throughout it. So I would say there's some extra stress in here. Well, why not? Because, you know, this is the real crux of the matter, is did you purposely in some way deliver some names in, in what is quite a libelous uh, nature? Did you maybe even purposely do it in a jurisdiction that means you're less likely to personally or the or the publishers get sued? I think the case now is they pulped all the books, so they were actually quite worried about about those names being in there, and you can't get a, a, a you can't get uh, uh, one of those books from a bookshop anymore. Uh, they're making new books uh, without those names in. Uh, and then stress, I never submitted a book. So there's there's a lot in that sentence which has a lot of stress on it and goes in the negative rather than the positive. It's an interesting way to, to answer it. He then says, uh, Chase, to your point about about muting emotions, there's a, there's a question there, are you upset by it? And he says he's operating in a bubble of no emotion, operating in a bubble of no emotion. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? You're above the usual human responses that you that you would expect to have. I mean, you know, if I'd put some names in a book and I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I think that I might get badly sued and bring down the monarchy, uh, which, uh, you know, I might be for or I might be against. But I mean, do I want to be that person in history that you know, well, there's Napoleon, there's there's Bourbon, there's oh, and then there's Scobie who brought down the monarchy. Do, like, do, is that is that the hill that I want the monarchy to is, do? I want to create the hill that the monarchy die on? Am I really am I really up at that level? I would probably have some emotions around that. He's saying he's in a bubble of absolutely no emotions whatsoever. I can't imagine that's correct unless he's the kind of person that has very few emotions about things. I mean, that's that's a possi possibility. Or it could be there's some there's some uh, some chemistry involved there, not only in what might be going through uh, through his the, you know his neurotransmitters. Um, uh, but also that his that his face doesn't move so much, and we do know actually with with Botox is that one of the things it it does is it can actually mute your emotional response because your face doesn't move as much, and the brain is often waiting exactly. for that cascade effect of muscles to move to to get a sense of oh here's the feeling that we're feeling right now, and if the face can't move, sometimes the brain doesn't know what feeling to get triggered with it's it's not a one-way system it's a it's a closed loop system the brain is waiting to see what the body does and the body's waiting to see what the brain asks it to do anyway interesting interesting situation greg what do you got on this one yeah so let's first talk about foreign language rights i've got books written in 10 or 12 languages i i can't read those books it might say putin's a penguin in there i don't have any idea i know what i sold i know what i gave them i know the transcript the manuscript i gave them so that's a realistic thing he can lean on and say, boom, he has rational thought train here. However, there are a couple of things that I would pay really close attention to. 
he knows that he can try to claim, hey, that's a mistranslation. Names are not translated ever. They're just transliterated. And if you're using the same the same script, they're the same name. So there would be no mistaking it. But what he can do is distance himself more. When you can, if you really want to see where his strength in this conversation and where his apprehension in this conversation are, it's very clear. His apprehension is when he first starts talking about played out, watch his lips purse. That's likely containment or disapproval as he pushes the lips forward. Then he does back to back, very heavy swallows. The male interviewer leans in on him and goes after him. He's browbeating him and batoning with his head now. Now, this is where we see that female interviewer really show hard disgust when the two names issue comes up. And then we watch him again. He looks like a child. His lower lip withdraws like he's waiting for approval. When he says mistranslate, he weaves a little bit in the chair. And now we see a real tongue jut. This is not grooming. This is a tongue jut push out when you say it's still being investigated. Here's another abandoned statement. Mark, the reason I was asking in that first one, it felt out of place. Like he came to give his soliloquy, the fourth wall. I'm going to drop this thing. I'm not bound by the same um, rules as others. Now he does another one where he says the reality is that everybody else knew. So he's setting up a story. He brought his pieces He's putting chess pieces on the board so that he can play out whatever it is he wants. He's saying everybody knows what this is, so somebody else could have. What they don't ask him is, did you cause to be published? Did you leak? Did you pass information through a third person? Those are the kind of questions we would want to know. If you stitch these two things together and you hear him saying, I'm not bound by the same rules and everybody knew it, so what is what I hear? That's pretty clearly an embedded confession to me. That's a person saying two things that if I link those two together, it gets pretty clear. And it looks like he teed one up for the other. Here's an interesting piece for me. You can tell where his confidence is because, Scott, you brought out in the first one, his fingers were together. When he gets down to the point where he's saying that it, it's being investigated, the translation, I didn't, I never submitted. Look at his fingers and thumbs. They're apart. I never submitted the book with those names in it. That's where that next question comes. Did you resource the answer? Did you leak the answer? Did you ensure somebody else gave him the name? But he gets away with it and moves away quietly. That's all I got. All right. One thing, Mark, going back to what you're talking about, about emotions and the face, Paul Ekman did a whole thing on that. Mm -hmm. where And so much so that I do this thing where I have a, this big box of these little mirrors I got at the dollar store. And so if it's small enough group, if it's 50 or under, then I take this box with me and I pass out these mirrors and I tell them to, to make the expression and explain to them how that works. So, yeah, that's a that's a fascinating uh, uh, study about how the expressions you make can actually um, ignite those emotions that that expression is making in exactly. your brain yep. and you'll feel better. That's why they say smile a lot and all that. But if you're frowning and for whatever you're doing, that, that, that will generate that feeling in you when you do that. So yeah, I went yeah. to like a, a John wick level gunfighting school. Uh, this was while I was in the military, except for you really can get killed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, during this school, it's like, it's, it's very long. It's several months long of school and it's hours and hours a day, but they have these GoPro cameras and stuff. Well, they're not GoPros, but they're some kind of a little camera. But if you make facial expressions while you're like moving through this, uh, like fake apartment building or doing anything, or you have a Should jam that they induce, like they'll stick rubber bullets in your magazine to make it jam. It's so like you don't deal with it right away and you show like a grimace or a fear response or angry face. You have to start over the whole school, not the day, the whole entire school. You go back to day one and they train out. You like you move through without making facial expressions and it lowers your level of fear gradually over the over the course of that school. And they do a few other things. But that was fascinating to me. That was the first time like I knew it consciously. But when they did that, like you can feel it. The fear goes away because the facial expressions go away. Yeah. Excellent. All right. <laughs> Let's take a look at the next one. Good story. One of those tape replays. It's a conversation that we should be having. That's, yeah. It, it, I mean, it really is. I guess it's the matter of the way things have played out since the book has come out. Um, primarily a name being named in the Dutch version of your book. Well, two um, names. Two, two names. names. Um, 
But that just seems bizarre to everybody out there because you don't accidentally put in a name and you can't put it down to mistranslation, can you? It does feel like a stunt to sell books, which I understand. I wish it was you the know, case. You, okay, how did it happen? Um, you know, it, it's still being investigated right now. What do you think happened? I wrote and edited the English version of the book with one publisher. That, co that then gets man uh, licensed to other publishers. I obviously can't speak Italian, German, yeah. French, Dutch, or any of the other languages that come out. So the only time you hear about the book is once it's come out in the public domain. I'm as frustrated as everyone else. I make it very clear in this book that I, in every way possible, want to adhere to the laws surrounding this subject. Mm. It's why I've been very careful in how it's described in the book. And it's why I've never spoken about it beyond what I've said in the public domain before. The reality is, though, is that this is information that is not privy just to me. Journalists across Fleet Street know, have known those names for a long time. We've all followed a certain code of conduct when it comes to talking about it. It's frustrating that now what's going on in the Netherlands with the book that was obviously immediately rescinded and is now being reprinted has happened, and I'm glad to hear so. But for me, I can only talk about the English version of the book that I wrote and produced. But are you and upset have never by been, it, though? Are you have upset never by been, it that, that those names came out when it had not, you didn't want that to happen? I had never submitted a book that had their names in it. So I can only talk about my version. Yeah. I'm obviously frustrated. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm upset about yeah. it because, to be honest, I've been operating in a bubble of no emotion for the last 10 days. But I am frustrated about it, just like I am many of the other things that I've seen. What's your end game? No, for me, I feel that we've reached a pinnacle moment with the royal family where we are having conversations about the purpose, relevancy, and future of the royal family. When we celebrated the life of the queen, we also celebrated the fact that she upheld a certain set of morals, values, ethics, and principles in that role. She was always above the fray. So for me to ask the question, do the current working royals all still uphold those same morals, values, and ethics, not just in front of the cameras, but behind palace walls, I think is a legitimate question to ask. I want to work, live in a world and report in a world where we can scrutinize the royal family in the same way we do politicians. These are not celebrities just there to be written about in a fun way. Of course, there is a light and fluffy side of that story. But this is also an establishment at the heart of our country. And so to have more serious conversations about them, which I do in the book, I feel is absolutely important. Do you believe in the monarchy? I do, actually. Do you want the monarchy to exist? If you had read the book, you'll see that there are yeah, many aspects... I look forward to it. Uh, ...many aspects of the monarchy I appreciate and have been proud of, but there are also many moments, I feel, that don't represent the Britain that we should be in today. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so he's using now... He's changed a lot at, at this point because he's now using a pin-down-and-bite movement on the sofa. So it's like almost kind of biting down on the sofa there with his hand, because this is the point that I think he's stored up to make in order to place him, you know, very much in a potentially in a hero situation, Scott, which is morals, values and ethics. Anybody could say, actually, you know, was it was it morally, ethically and what are your values if you if you leak these these names? Uh, you know, you are maybe breaking some ethical codes, certainly some ethical codes by doing that. Well, he's coming back on that to say uh, monarchy is not uh, representative of of the British public in general, I think is his his theory here. And um, and he wants to be part of the conversation towards a more representative body, which we probably go is, OK, you, you, you want a Republican, a republic system, essentially not a constitutional monarchy, which is what Britain has uh, at, at the moment. So it's, it's, a, it's you know, he's come in now and he's now doing politics, I would say, essentially, and he's biting down uh, on that and taking the stage on that. What I love, what I love most about this is, uh, what was his name again? Is it Dylan? Craig, Craig, Craig Doyle. Because he says, well, if you if you would have read the book and Craig says, I look forward to it, I look forward to it. I, 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 I'm going to remember that for I mean, I hope I get to, to deliver a line like that at some point. That is that is etched in my memory as a 
brilliant riposte to that dig that that uh, Scobie puts in there. Brilliantly done, brilliantly done. That that for me, that moment was worth the price of admission alone on this. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? I agree with you. I think he's not going to read that book anymore, and we are. <laughs> so that was just that was just a classic up years. I think it was. Gosh, and just totally just like it was nothing. Just said it and kept moving. Oof, that was a good, that was a good one. You're right, I agree. That's a good one. I think this is really interesting because when he talks about what he thinks and what he wants and how he wants to report and the kind of world he wants when he's illustrating over there on the couch where he's hitting that illustrators, as we always talk about on here are that's when your brain emphasizes specific words and phrases like I did just then specific words and phrases. And up to this point, pretty much he's been right here in front of himself, but he's keeping those arms in, which means he's sort of on guard as well because his brain, I don't think he feels safe there. He shouldn't because of the position he's in because the way she's looking at him, the way this guy's coming on hard to him. So I, so he's, he's a little bit, uh, he's on guard there. But when he starts, I think that's why I think this answer was given to him. He, he had somebody help create this answer for him, but he did it with him because he's he's doing he's illustrating on the couch. No reason to be illustrating on the couch. Why would he be doing that at that point? He had this really weird looking fish thing going on up here, pointing his hand and and those little things. But then he's way over here on the couch. So I don't think that was his. I don't think the, I, I think the main parts of that weren't parts that he came up with or wrote quote unquote, because he's a writer. And like I said before, man, he's, he, his answers are really good and clean. They're the words he's used. Everything gets right to the point. So it's really tough to do that. If you find somebody really smart, they can do that quite often. They'll, they'll just lay it right out in, in the perfect wording. And he does that almost too often in this for me. Anyway, it makes me wonder because I'm sure he's bright, but he doesn't look like the smartest guy in the world, not just because he doesn't look like it, but I don't know. Some just tells me that he's not the smartest guy in the world. So that that's what I thought was really odd, and that's why I think somebody helped him with that answer. And then he says, uh, and you're right, Mark, when he says, uh, if you had read the book, I think I don't think that the guy is being is trying to be nice or anything. I think that was just his his way to 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 let him have it. And the the the, the woman interviewer, no change there. Everything's the same. She's when when she's talking, she didn't even look at him, and then she's her torso is still, you know to the side a little bit. She's not even trying to engage with him. She's had it. She's got it figured out. She has it figured out. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I think this thing starts off with enough contempt from both parties to go around. You can't miss that rise in one side of the face on the part of the interviewer and on the part of Scobie. And he starts off, I think, Scott, the reason he's doing this on the side is he's making his point. And I would guess this is not a conflict-friendly guy. Just looking at him, just paying attention. I've been in a lot of conflicts in my life, and he doesn't strike me as a guy getting a lot of conflict with. He just not doesn't, doesn't play the part. So he's doing, he's very clearly batoning with his head and likely his hands. We can't see his hands when he says purpose and future and relevancy. So he's starting off with this fourth wall where he's got something he wants to tell you and you're going to listen. He's free flowing. He's forthright. There's full disclosure. His whole soliloquy is going beautifully until he's asked, do you believe in the monarchy? Boom. You see those lips purse and then back. And he goes, actually, anytime somebody says actually, I go, hold on a minute. Did I ask you about actual? Let's just wait. I'm going to listen. Then he qualifies. He says, actually, many aspects. Then he goes on. I, As he does this, I think, he, like you said, Mark, he doesn't think the monarchy represents the UK. I would have leaned in and said, so wh what would you do differently? How would you fix that? And I would have forced him to answer some questions. Interestingly, I don't think I've ever heard of a monarchy that's representative. Just not how those governments work. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, and I, I think what he's doing is he's pulling what I call the strings of the people. He's talking about things that lots of people can agree on in kind of generalized terms. And this is a hostage negotiation tactic of the FBI. It's taught to suicide hotline operators. It's taught to all kinds of people. This is, I'm going to say a bunch of things that make you unconsciously agree over and over and over and get you to start mentally, even if you don't do it physically, mentally nodding your head as I'm talking. So he's, he's buying agreement by doing this. And as a behavior profiler, there's one thing that's seemingly, I think, more common now in the media 
And this is how certain elements of a person's appearance, their hair, eyebrows, their wardrobe, are just meticulously tailored to project an image of perfection. But I think it's this very pursuit of flawlessness uh, that I think can ironically render their persona as looking artificial as hell to, to normal people. So when, when these people speak, our response is instinctive and it's unconscious. We perceive their words and their emotions to be just as manufactured as everything about their appearance. And I think that's why a lot of people get this gut feeling, because everything is fake. So it's important to understand that this isn't about specific behavioral changes or patterns or anything. It's more subtle, and it's about an underlying feeling, like an intuition, uh, that something isn't really authentic here. And we're faced with a facade of perfection, and it's challenging to see past that to a, anything genuine underneath. And I think this creates a disconnect and maybe a sense of disbelief in all of us where we find ourselves maybe questioning not just what we see, but what we hear. And uh, in a lot of these scenarios, the more perfect the presentation is, the more we tend to doubt the sincerity of the person behind it. There's an idea of a person here, but it's more of a simulation of a person than an, uh, just a simulation of an ideal. There's not anything real or genuine whatsoever about this stuff that we're looking at here. One of those tape replays. What's your end game? No, for me, I feel that we've reached a pinnacle moment with the royal family where we are having conversations about the purpose, relevancy, and future of the royal family. When we celebrated the life of the queen, we also celebrated the fact that she upheld a certain set of morals, values, ethics, and principles in that role. She was always above the fray. So for me to ask the question, do the current working royals all still uphold those same morals, values, and ethics, not just in front of the cameras, but behind palace walls, I think is a legitimate question to ask. I want to work, live in a world and report in a world where we can scrutinize the royal family in the same way we do politicians. These are not celebrities just there to be written about in a fun way. Of course, there is a light and fluffy side of that story. But this is also an establishment at the heart of our country. And so to have more serious conversations about them, which I do in the book, I feel is absolutely important. Do you believe in the monarchy? I do, actually. Do you want the monarchy to exist? And to if you had read the book, you'll see that there are yeah, many well, aspects... I look forward to it. Uh, ...many aspects of the monarchy I appreciate and have been proud of, but there are also many moments, I feel, that don't represent the Britain that we should be in today. Piers Morgan was saying that he had no conversations with Camilla. He's called you an outright liar. What would you say to him? I don't know what he says. I only go by the reporting that I have. Um, I also, went, as I was researching this, and as you see cited in the references at the back, he's spoken a lot about his friendship with Camilla, yeah. the Queen. So, listen, I, I, I don't know what to make of that, but I only go by the information that I have. He's also said a lot of things about me and the story and so on that is also not true. So I don't think, I don't find that particularly credible. In he's also way. said stuff about Meghan in the past as well. So, you know. Yes. Yeah. You know, he also in, wrote in an op-ed this week saying that um, they should be burned alive or something yeah, like that. Yeah. So. <laughs> none of that, but none of that's <laughs> acceptable. All right, Greg, what do you got? So if he's lying, call him a liar, number one. Number two, if you call me a liar, there's probably some emotion associated with it, unless I know I'm a liar, then I'm going to probably think about how do I respond to that. And I may look down into my right as I'm accessing emotional things about what the guy said about me, or I may have no reaction. What he's doing is an internal conversation, looking down into his left as he's thinking about what to say. Mark, I'm going to hand it off to you when I'm done with this, because I'm going to say, is it just not British to say, hey, the guy's a liar? Because it's very American to say the guy's a liar. It took him 27 seconds, go watch it, to come up with the accusation. And then he just chaffs like all hell. This makes me think of a Mike Tyson quote. You don't get to use these every day. But he said, social media made you all way too comfortable with disrespecting people and not getting punched in the face for it. That's exactly what we're seeing right here. If you call me a liar and I come back at you I, and I'm afraid to do that, this is just crazy. What I do like is we get to see a sync opportunity. The male interviewer syncs with Scobie and the dislike appears and then he leans back in the chair and it is the brilliant because what happens then, Scobie 
starts to spill his lunch. He starts telling him exactly what's happened. Mark, is it just not British to call somebody else? I, uh, it's not friends. that it's not British. You can do, but you tend to have to do it from America, which is why uh, <laughs> peers can, 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 you know, kind of do that, but from, you know, from a different vantage point. Yeah, you, 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 uh, you know, you're better off inferring it and everybody knowing you're inferring that and giving people a way out i would say simply because in 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 the uk we have a in britain we have a, a history of wars and so the last thing you want to do is rile up anybody enough that you know aggression will start because that can be a day-to-day -day thing in the in the uk so um I think at this point as well, uh, there's been a word into the ear of of um, Alison Hammond to go. Alison, last question. Let's let's move that on because I think we see her hand go across. She suppresses on, I believe, the knee of of Doyle. Uh, he he pulls back. He readjusts himself. So emotionally, he's now readjusting himself because now they need a light out on this one. They need something to lighten the thing to get onto the next thing. There's going to be some adverts in a moment. Let's get everybody in a bit of a, a good mood to hear from our sponsors, you know, who are paying for all of this. And, and let's let's move on. So I think that's what's happening here is a, is a whole kind of readjustment that allows them to bring up the idea of of um, of Piers Morgan. You know, everybody agrees a bit of a Jack the Lad and can say some awful things and, and you know, and who who knows what he's what he's on with and 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 look, no, nobody's ever gonna say anything as ridiculous as Piers. So so let's all move on. I think I think that's what's happening here. Again, what's interesting is you get a big change here. We get the male here who's been very forthright, not necessarily so forthright as saying you're a you're an outright outright liar but has been really quite aggressive for this this time of day and this type of show being you know touched to kind of hold back now he does come back he does readjust the whole mood lightens somewhat it gives an entry for scoby to be a little more uh, attacking and going look i don't know i don't know i don't pay any attention to peers i don't know what he's on about and he does he does he's on his own little witch hunt as well and wants them all burnt so interesting but there is inside of this i think probably as hard a interview as you can probably get at this time slot with this bunch and I think we don't see somebody reacting in a very extreme emotional way to that. So it is quite interesting how he, how governed and regulated this person is within all of that. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Uh, so I, I totally agree with you. And one thing that we're seeing here in this clip, this little vein right here on the side of his neck start popping out. And in the medical field, we call this jugular vein distension. So his jugular vein visibly swells up, especially just after Pierce Morgan's name comes up. So it's a classic case of what I would call jugular vein distension. That's our body's textbook response to stress. So the heart races, blood pressure shoots up, and boom, there's a bulging, uh, a bulging vein right there. So for SCOBY, it seems like just the mention of Pierce Morgan was enough to kind of trigger this reaction. I think it's fascinating how our bodies can so perfectly reveal our feelings even before we, you know, put them into words or we're really processing a lot of that stuff. And I think it's worth noting here that this vein distension takes a couple of seconds because it's blood that's going back to the heart. So if you see this, you may want to rewind a little bit. You may want to go back in the conversation about five or six seconds to figure out what topic might have caused that jugular vein distension. Now, I think overall, uh, Scobie's response is a mix of defensive posturing, reliance on this documented ev evidence, and just passing moral judgment. And he positions himself as a fact-focused and uh, ethically opposed uh, to the you know kind of rhetoric that he attributes to Morgan, while he's also displaying this personal bias, which is kind of influenced by his maybe his experiences or his dealings with uh, with Morgan or something in the past. But 
there's a lot of stuff going on here, but guess what you won't see here? Anything genuine, anything that resembles a natural, genuine, raw human being, uh, just being real. Scott? All right, you guys covered everything. I could go, I, my notes pretty much cover the same stuff. So to keep it from being boring, let's move on. One of those tape replays. Piers Morgan was saying that he had no conversations with Camilla. He's called you an outright liar. What would you say to him? I don't know what he says. I only go by the reporting that I have. Um, I also, where, as I was researching this, and as you see cited in the references at the back, he's spoken a lot about his friendship with Camilla, yeah. the Queen. So, listen, I, I, I don't know what to make of that, but I only go by the information that I have. He's also said a lot of things about me and the story and so on that is also not true. So I don't think, I don't find that particularly credible. He's also way. said stuff about Meghan in the past as well. So, you know. Yes. Yeah. You know, he also in, wrote in an op-ed this week saying that um, they should be burned alive or something yeah, like that. Yeah. So <laughs> none of that, but none of that's acceptable. All right, Mark, what are you seeing up to this point? What do you think's going on? Well, look, here's what I'll say is I've seen what would be close up the top of my top 10 ever put downs, which is, which is, <laughs> which is, if you'd read the book, I look forward to it. I think that's, that's, that's beautiful. That was beautifully done. I've tucked that one away in my back pocket. I hope the occasion calls for me to bring that out at some point. Brilliant. Chase, what have you been saying? Greg, you brought up the fourth wall. And I'm so glad that you did, because it's such a perfect explanation for what we're really seeing here. Uh, a lot of people, when Greg's talking about the fourth wall, if you think of the show Seinfeld, the fourth wall means the invisible wall where the audience is. That's the fourth wall. I think we're looking at a person who doesn't know that they don't ever leave the stage. I don't think he leaves the stage at all. I think his whole life is like this like a, a performance. And this reminded me of that. I think maybe maybe you all saw it during COVID. This guy's on like the news or something. He's doing an interview. And his, his little daughter, who's like four years old, three years oh, old, yeah. sneaks into the room. And his reaction is to pretend like she doesn't exist and start stuffing her in the face. Like, what is wrong with human beings when that's not a priority? And like, you, you can't, you have to pretend so freaking hard that you're a perfect human being that doesn't even have children. That's how perfect you are. You don't have kids. You don't have a family. Nothing goes wrong in your life. That's what we're seeing here. And I had a hard time with just the layers of artificiality. There's this semi-artificial person sitting in a fake studio with fake windows surrounded by fake Christmas greenery talking about Meghan Harry, who live as a simulation of perfection. And I think it shows how deeply we're all kind of looking through layers of illusion every day of our lives. Now, I think I think there's a part of us that's kind of starving for some kind of authenticity. And I think that's why people like Joe Rogan have completely surpassed and eclipsed media outlets like CNN by almost any measure you can think of. Greg? Yeah, well, life is gritty and simple for a lot of people, and they spend their time on this, and all they're doing is playing with this and the, you know prodding around, and they need stimulation somewhere else. So they get it from wherever. I think people want to believe in Disney-esque life, and they want the royals to live a Disney-esque life. However, the royals are not a made-up group. They're a group that's descended from a form of government, to your point, Mark, that's not representative. And if you don't like that, you don't like it. You might come on and say that. I think this guy is conflict diverse. And there are a handful of reasons I say that. He came in doing this fourth walling. And by that, I quite literally mean there's a glass pane. And he wants to deliver what he brought. And if you don't believe that, two orphan statements. The first one, I'm not bound by the same rules. The second one, to be honest, or the reality is he's bleeding information and saying, however it got there, it doesn't matter. It isn't me because he's avoiding the conflict. And then finally, when he is actually nailed down and said, Piers Morgan called you a liar, are you? What does he do? He chaffs and redirects and says, I know you are, but what am I? He does a childish move to say, Piers Morgan's an awful liar. Never says anything about himself and then moves on. I think the guy's conflict diverse, and that's the reason it brought the Mike Tyson comment to my mind. Because a lot of people, to your point, Chase, they're living in a bubble. They're living in a glass cage. And they believe that because they can click and make you go away, that your opinions go away. And that their opinion is pure as it is in whatever form. 
they can spout when they come out in public. And Mike Tyson's comment comes to mind because the fragmentation of society gets, it's going to get a lot of people punched in the face if they act that way. Scott, what do you got? I think this is a great example of seeing the female brain at work compared to the male brain at work and see her reactions compared to his reactions. His are just, you know, they're thin and all that. Hers are deep and you can see it because she's all but side eyeing this guy. Those eyes get all squinty and all that. She knows and she's not saying it. And I think that's the hardest part for her is we're seeing somebody hold back that emotion of you got to be kidding, leaning into it and doing all that, which I I, I think she would want to be doing at that point. I think it's a great example of that, of seeing the two brains working at the same time in real time. We're watching that go down. Also, Chase, I agree with you. I saw the first time I saw that, I saw a little kid come marching in the room, having the best time just being a kid. And this guy totally faces this kid and just ignore I thought because he had the chance to be the coolest guy in the whole world man he could have had everybody right there all he had to do was pick that little kid up and kiss on it real big and put it back down and scoot it on oh man that guy I think about that actually sometimes when I see that and that other one was coming in there that little walker remember that had that little circle thing around it was walking around that lady's trying to catch the other little baby oh man this guy is completely that oh man he had the chance of a lifetime and blew it. He could have been the coolest guy in the world. But ugh. we have to be you're still talking about it to start. <laughs> like you have to have your head in the right space to to th even think of that. Or yeah. be a but, 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 but if he doesn't care, you're still talking about him. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he deserves it. Unfortunate part. Yeah. Okay. All right, fellas. Thanks is another good one. And we'll see you next time. So what do you got? <laughs>